Yeah, so everyone, we're going to get started at, uh, in about two minutes. Um, we've uh, also brought on Emmett with us um, so we can uh, answer any uh, financing or mortgage questions that you may have on this. Um, to take advantage of these opportunities, capital is going to be required, whether it's your own personal capital or um, it's other people's capital, a aka the bank's money. Um, and Emma can uh, help facilitate that as well. So there, there are definitely huge opportunities uh, out there uh, and uh, that will continue to present themselves. So i um, excited to, to talk to everyone about that. And uh, thank you all for taking time to listen to us today. Uh, this will be recorded wise, so if there is something you miss, um, this will be posted on our website and emailed to everyone that signed up <clears throat> after the fact. Now, don't just go run and sign off. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, we have some great dialogue here, uh, and there is a, a live uh, question and answer as well. So basically, the format will go. Um, we'll have a little chat to start with wise, talk about some statistics wise, what we see on the ground here. Um, and then we, uh, the second half, we open up to questions wise that people uh, may have. Um, again, um, we have Amit, our uh, resident mortgage professional here. Um, so we can, we can talk finance, um, we can talk capital, we can talk mortgages. We can, we can answer questions the current market wise. Um, we're, we're here at your disposal. So we just hit the, the 1105 mark. So we will uh, begin. Uh, my name's Alex Wilson. Um, broker owner of Remax Wealth Builders Real Estate. Um, we also have Kyle DeVigi with us, uh, co-founder of Wealth, uh, Wealth Builders Real Estate, um, uh, Remax Wealth Builders Real Estate, um, and combined uh, real estate assets. Uh, what are we at now, Kyle? Combined real estate assets, close to 20 million, 17 million, 18 million, something like that? Pretty close to that. Over yeah. properties, 22, I think, in total. Well, yeah. So, 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 and, and we, we predominantly invest in condos wise. Um, the reason is, uh, I find them very scalable. Number one, they're concrete boxes in the sky, very minimal headaches that I receive on those. Um, and as well, uh, we do attract a triple eight clientele to move it, move into those. So the actual management of the asset wise, very limited to do because we're just managing box, which is the concrete, uh, walls. The rest of the building that's managed by someone else, um, we're just we're just uh, focused in on the box wise. So that's number one. Um, number two, we get the AAA clientele, um, so we're not really about not not worried about payment and non-payment of rent. And then uh, number three, um, when I compare this to to multi-residential, which I also own as well, um, and there's great money to be made there. Uh, what the upside on a condo purchase is is that on a multi-res that is a pure numbers driven play. So uh, depending on what the cap rate uh, that's, that's trading in the area wise, that's gonna dictate the value of the asset. On a condo wise, um, you have emotions that come into play because most likely when you sell that asset, it'll be an end user that's buying that asset. So they're not so much focused on uh, what's my rent, how am I gonna cover costs? They're like, well, I need a roof over my head that aligns with my my own personal uh, monthly cash flow wise and what you'll see is that you'll get a higher sales value uh per unit wise on the condo than you would a multi-res wise because you have that emotional factor maslow's hierarchy of needs uh food shelter warmth basic human needs that's what we're in the business of selling wise whether we're renting that out or when we when we look at selling an asset and then on top of that was, if I have 10 condos and I sell one, I still have nine condos. So, so there is a liquid, there's a liquidity to that too. Um, so you, you can, you can sell some of your, your, your portfolio wise and still have a number of other portfolios. So we, we focus in on condos wise. That's what, what our, our portfolio is made up of. Um, and then we have Amit, um, who is from a volume perspective, um, the largest, um, dealer of mortgages in Ontario wise. Um, and himself also a real estate investor and works not just with ourselves, but also the top um, condo sales reps um, across the GTA um, and Canada-wise. Um, so uh, he's also a, uh, a, a 
C, we, we, is a CA or a CPA? Now I'm dating myself when they change des designations. Wise, do, do we do we call you a CPA or a CA now? Uh, both. So I was lucky I got the, the CA before they amalgamated into CPA, and so uh, I have to both. So so Emmett also brings uh, a chartered accountant uh, eyes to 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 this, so he knows um, how to to structure and finance deals, um, which is is is, is key in, in growing a portfolio wise. And uh, when we talk about that, um, Emmett, who can get a mortgage? Everybody. <laughs> Everyone. Everybody. There's not a single person that can't get a mortgage. It's just about uh, which bank and what rate. Exactly. It doesn't matter if you're a first time buyer or you're buying your 27th property. And we've learned that over the years. And, 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 and what he's referring to is there's always ways to finance deals wise. Does it mean you're getting the lowest possible rate out there? Absolutely not. Um, but if the upside on the property makes sense for you to go into uh, a, a different lending tool wise, um, then when you look at the overall picture wise, it makes sense to go into that tool. So I've gotten the best rates from the bank and I've, I've also borrowed all the way on the private side as well through my, through my investment journey wise. So there's always options out there for everyone. And if you go to the, I, yeah, go ahead. I think where people get uh, stuck is that uh, we normally see just the banks on the street, you know, the BMOs, the TDs, the RBCs, all the branches. And, uh, you know, even until I became a broker, uh, you don't realize that there's actually almost 45 different um, banks in Canada and they all differ. Um, there's some that people have heard of like PC and Tangerine and Manulife. And, and then there's some people have never heard of like RFA and Exceed and Know, MCAP and so on and so forth. So um, the list goes on and on. And some banks only want clients with 10 or more properties and some won't look at clients with less than, with, with no more than five. So everybody fits into some bracket. And 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 we, we've, we've done detailed webinars on those. If you go to our website, remaxwealth.com, you go to the insights tab, uh, you'll you'll see our webinars on leverage wise with Emmett, where we go into detail wise the different funding that you can do. Now, where the opportunity is? Well, Kyle, why don't you start off with just giving some some statistics comparing the market currently to 2019, so people can get a good understanding um, why we're, we're we already see some opportunities and why we expect to continue to see opportunities over the next six months. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So we actually took a deep dive looking at some of the numbers towards the end of October to really quantify what's happening out there in the current market. And we took a look comparing the last week of October of 2020 compared to that same time period in 2019 to try to get an apples to apples comparison. And what we found was this. Uh, in 2019, last week of October, there were almost 1500 units available for rent downtown. That sounds like a lot, but in a, a city, you know, Toronto the size of 3 million people, that's actually not that many. There are very low vacancy rates. Fast forward a year, and there were over 6,900 units available. That's about a 370% increase. It's still quite small. Vacancy rates still haven't skyrocketed, but there is a significant number of units available for rent, um, more than there were this time last year. And we're seeing that starting to spill over into the resale market as well. So in 2019, there were just under 700 units available in that time period. And fast forward to October 2020, and there were almost 3,000 units available, condos in the downtown core. And that's over a 300% increase as well. So we're seeing significant supply coming to the market, both on the rental side and the resale side. And so that you may have a question, well, why is that happening? Well, obviously... Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic wise and how, why that's impacted specifically downtown Toronto is there is no reason for people to be downtown Toronto right now. Number one, you may live downtown Toronto if you want to live close to work. Well, office buildings are closed and they'll realistically be closed till summer 2021. I'm sure we have a number of people on this call that go, yeah, you know, I, I haven't been back to the office since March wise. Um, so number one, no reason to live close to work because work isn't open. Number two, uh, from a lifestyle perspective wise, um, people love the, the vibrancy of downtown. You go, you go to restaurants, 
you go to maybe catch an, uh, an after work drink with someone, um, you want to go to the concerts, the live events, um, food shows, all those different things that, that drive people in the downtown core. None of those are open right now. Zero. None of that. So from a lifestyle perspective, that's gone. So uh, number three from, um, from people coming into the city wise, well, international students, that number was uh, severely reduced this year uh, due to the uh, COVID concerns. So we had a significant drop in the international student population that typically comes to uh, the GTA and specifically to downtown core. Number four, immigration um, was severely impacted this year wise. So all those things, so A, from a typical standpoint, reasons people live downtown, um, those uh, are completely gone for 2020. And the number two, where we get more people coming into the city wise from other countries or other provinces or other cities, you know, that's gone because international, uh, you know, from a student perspective, not as many people are going to school. And from an immigration perspective, those numbers have severely dropped. Well, these are very acute things that are going to go away um, once uh, the population gets vaccinated wise. So number one, um, live events will come back to downtown Toronto, sporting venues will open back up, concerts will open back up. Um, the actual uh, infrastructure for those events are only in downtown Toronto. Those will come back to downtown Toronto. Um, your restaurants will open, the ones that survive this will open back up. And then as demand comes, up, there'll be new people that come into the old spaces and, and, and operate in those, just simple supply and demand. So th th those will come back. So the lifestyle perspective will come back. From a working perspective, office towers will open back up, back up and people will go back to the office. Uh, I can tell you if there's any parents on here, they are dying to get to the office. I can say I, I, I go to the office daily wise. I've been going to the office since uh, May 1st. Uh, I have a one and three year old. I, I have to run away from my house wise um, to, to, get, to get work done. The people will go back to the office. There is a collaboration aspect that cannot be mimicked uh, by being off site wise, there is something that, that happens. Yes, people are more efficient by working from home. Um, there are distractions, hypothetically, uh, depending if you're able to, to close off your family and in your household world wise, there are some efficiencies that come from working from home, but the collaboration aspect that it suffers. Um, and so you can, you can tread water and, and, and increase productivity uh, and, and efficiency during this period wise, but to do those big jobs in collaboration, that's where you hurt uh, when, when you have too many people working, working away from home. Um, and I'm gonna bring Kyle in, he can talk about that briefly wise, um, not even from his perspective, but his uh, wife's perspective and, and her experiences on that. Um, and this is all pre-COVID stuff as well. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, my wife works for a pharmaceutical company and they're an international company. So she worked with teams um, located in Toronto, but also in San Francisco, um, in Switzerland, and really globally. And she has people on those teams from each of those different sites. So number one, trying to find a, a time that works for all of those different sites is almost impossible. Um, so what they actually did a lot was face-to-face -face meetings. Teleconference calls, you know, like Alex said, it's easy to tread water. Um, you can kind of maintain the status quo. But when you need to take it to the next level, when you need to innovate and make progress quickly, they have those face-to-face -face meetings. They get everyone together in this so that you can work on a project, you know, for eight hours, bang it out, and quickly and efficiently make progress. And they found that they were able to advance projects much, much more quickly, few days of meetings than if they had been on conference calls for you know, six months. They just wouldn't get the same quality of work, level of work and engagement from people. And that's what you get from going into the office, from that face-to-face -face exposure with your coworkers, that collaboration um, and the environment that it fosters. Yeah, and um, where was, where was I going with this? I, 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 I lost myself in, in, in that train of thought wise. But you are going to have the people come back. Now, you, you, what we won't see, or you may not see as much of, the five day, five day a week, we expect the office, that is going to change. 100% that's going to change. But it's not going to drop to zero wise. You're going to have some sort of hybrid solution 
where people are coming in three, four times a week, depending on the roles and the position wise, where there is, they're going to be in the office wise. And then the other times they're going to be working at the offsite or, or at their homes wise. And the infrastructure is there to bring everyone in a collaborative space in the downtown uh, core. So we have very acute things that are happening are impacting the downtown market. They're all essentially man-made wise, but the permanent infrastructure is already there. So once we remove these acute items, you're going to see people flooding back to the downtown core. Don't put an asterisk beside this. Uh, one area I do think will lead in recovery will be public transportation. I can't see anyone rushing back to be like this on the Young Subway line or on the Bloor line. Um, anyone that's taken that during rush hour wise, oh my God, it's crazy. You you may have one, two, three trains go by to get on. And then when you're able to squeeze on, you're, you're literally everyone's in everyone's space. Things are on the ground wise. That, that that will take some time for people to, to get used to that. So I do think from a public transportation perspective, I think that will lag. But where that benefits the downtown condo wise is now people are like, well, I need to live closer to work wise. You know, I want to rely on the most reliable form of transportation, my two legs. I'm outside. It's fresh. I'm going to live close to the office within a 30 minute walk. I'll walk to work. Um, and, and that way I avoid the, the, the public transportation um, situation there. So that's where it's, I think you'll see the boom in regards to a quick boom, a quick V shape or plastic wise when buildings start opening. <coughs> buildings start opening back up and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to see people drive back into there. I'm not, I'm not sure which one has people in the background. Who has people in the background? In their office that, would, right that would be me. I have the door closed. Don't. Oh, oh, do, do you want just, just mute yourself and then I then we won't hear that in the background. Perfect. There we go. So, so you're, you're going to see a quick yo-yo wise in regards to people wanting to live close to the office and because they're not going to maybe want to jump, jump on public transportation wise. So you, you'll, you'll see that re to, to rebound quickly wise. So that's where we see where Kyle said the statistics wise, where we're nearly 7,000 units on the market for rent, nearly 3,000 units on the market for sale in downtown, where historically our vacancy rate was, was less than 1%. Um, and we were treading, you know, typically around one month supply of inventory for sale wise in downtown condos. The reason things are up because of the cute item, no one has a reason to be downtown right now. So what we're going to see, we already have a lot of listings on the market. We're going to see some of those lease listings turn over to the sale side as uh, investors decide, hey, you know what, maybe I'm just better off selling if I can't rent this unit out. I don't want to get this unit uh, for rent wise. But I think we can all agree that these numbers aren't going to stay they, the way they are because again, everything that's happening is man-made right now. And I'm going to give a live example, um, a unit that sold last week. So there was a studio at uh, 27 Bathurst, Minto Westside building wise, building um, completed uh, in 2019, um, registered in 2020, studio there just sold for $399,000. Um, if we did not have a COVID situation, that unit would be probably close to $500,000. And the, the pre-COVID rent on that unit was $1,900. The COVID rent is $1,300. So it's a $600 a month uh, difference in regards to the rental rates wise. So what you'll see is you'll see in probably about 18 months, that rental rate will go back up to $1,900. Um, and that valuation will go back up to the, the close to $500,000 mark wise, as people flood back to the downtown core, there's a reason for them to live downtown again. But the people were able to jump on the opportunity now, and they bought the unit for $399,000. Yes, they will take a hit of $1,300 a month in rent. So that's a $600 drop wise. So if we do that over uh, 12 months, hypothetically wise, uh, we're looking at a uh, $7,200 reduction in, in, in the rental valuation wise. But we're going to make a 100, 100K bump on, 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 the, on the increase of the valuation of the property. And when market rates return to, to normal, this building specifically is 
a, a does not have rent controls. So when I can adjust things to market market rates. So in 2022, when we expect full, when I expect full recovery, when Kyle expects recovery, when uh, when Emmett respects recovery in regards to these pricings wise, I'll be able to increase the rent from 1300 to 1900 on that unit wise. As long as my tenant is month to month, there's not a one year lease in place. And I give 90 days notice, I have rent controls. So where the opportunity is, is if you're buying in a building that is built after November 15th, 2018, those buildings do not have rent controls. So what you wanna do is you buy the dip in that, in these select buildings wise, you get a good deal on a unit, you put a warm body in there in regards to, you gotta rent it out, you're gonna get some cash flow in, you may end up being negative wise if you're doing a 20% down payment model. Now, part of that is offset by the reduction in interest rates right now. You know, it, on my specific Minto West, West Side unit, I use the example I own in the building was when I got my mortgage in January, uh, my mortgage rate is 3%. So this the spread on the mortgage, it's I'm sub two now. So we have over a 1% difference in, in the interest rate wise. So some of the reduction of the rental rental wise, I'm offset by the um, <clears throat> uh, offset by the uh, reduction in interest rates and also the reduction in pricing wise. So again, I'm probably looking at a negative situation could be anywhere between one to $200 per month. Again, if I'm factoring that in, I'm making a hundred K on, on the bump in appreciation wise, but I'm only out cash flow wise, $200 a month, that's $2,400 over a year period. And again, that's not negative equity. That's, that's just negative cash flow wise. Emmett uh, had some guy on there. So also, if we look at the trend, like just taking your Minto West side as an example, uh, you know, when we did the deal, it was at 3%. But at that time, 3% was manageable because the rent was higher. Yep. And if you look at the economics of, you know, the Canadian government and global economies, uh, interest rates have plummeted uh, due to COVID. And so those cash flows also get better. So I think, yes, the rents have dropped, but simultaneously when you uh, combine the deferral programs plus the lower interest rates for people that were in a variable, um, people are still managing that cash flow, which is why and you know, I haven't seen defaults or, or people, you know, power of sailing their, their properties. And so when we look at um, dollar for dollar, I think it goes with the market. And, and to add to your, you know, people are skeptical. Like, how do we know downtown is going to get better? How do we know the rents will go back from 13 to 19? Well, industries have changed. Um, businesses uh, that are in e-commerce, uh, they're going to be hiring more. And, and they're the ones that have those hundred and two hundred thousand dollars jobs. Uh, in the downtown core and you, you may have an exodus of you know 20,000 bank employees uh, but you're going to probably have an insertion of you know tens of thousands of uh, high paying tech jobs and, and other industries that are booming so it's more of you know it was up it came down it's going to flip back up yes there's going to be a shift in work culture but there's also going to be a shift in the type of work and from an investor perspective the more high net worth, high income earners that come into the core, which is what I think we're going to expect. You're going to see the condo market continue to go up, which is why Toronto out of all the G7 or G20 countries is still year over year up. Uh, you know, you look at it and you think that doesn't make sense. The world is going upside down, but Toronto's real estate keeps inching upwards. It's because these metrics are baked into the future expectations. Yep. And, and that, and that when we, that's when we flow into, so we talked about immigration wise and, and I didn't go, I didn't dive deep into it, but when we look at immigration numbers rebounding into uh, 2021, they've in, increased levels to uh, over 400,000, uh, increasing in 2022 and 2023. These are marks, the highest uh, immigration level since um, well, 1919, I think it was. Um, so people have to understand our economy relies on Im immigration. Growth is tied directly to immigration wise. And the immigration that we're bringing in, it's skilled labor. It's wealth-based individuals wise. Um, it's people that are gonna drive the economy upward wise. And because we are in a recovery mode, these immigration um, levels are 
required. It, it is a it, it is going to be a, a major driver in the economic recovery of Canada West. Now, now when we go back to the worldwide, as as Emmett said, if we look at where Canada is on the worldwide scale, if I'm if I'm sitting in another country, it's like where do I want to bring my family? Well, in the UK, we're still we're we're still dealing with Brexit wise, okay, and and Brexit was was driven by immigration anti immigration. So I'm not I'm not going to England. The U.S. Even though uh, we are seeing a shift in power from from um, Donald Trump uh, to Biden, still 72 million people voted for Donald Trump. It is still a very, very, very divided country wise. Um, so there are still things that are going to be sort sorted out there. Yes, there are there are going to be more pro immigration policies coming in the the U.S. wise, but it's still very, very, very divided. Um, so where are people going to going to really relocate to? Uh, Australia is very difficult to get into in regards to a relocation uh, destination wise, um, and you're kind of isolated there in the South Pacific. So now you are, well, Canada, Canada is safe and boring. But when you're looking at going somewhere from, from a, a more chaotic situation, safe and boring is what you're looking for. Safe and boring is what you want to raise your family in. Safe and boring is a very valuable currency wise. So from an immigration standpoint, post COVID wise, we're going to look very attractive as a country wise. And don't forget from a currency perspective wise, when I bring up England, when I bring up United States, from a currency perspective, we have the lowest value currency wise. So when I'm translating my dollars from my, my base country, my home country to, to my relocating country wise, the dollar goes a lot farther when you're looking at the, the Canadian uh, based economy wise. So immigration will, will rebound significantly wise uh, when people are looking uh, to come uh, to their next country wise. The only downside, it's a little quick. Yeah. And Alex, I want, I want to add some, some yeah. numbers to that. Like you mentioned, we're looking at adding 400,000 new permanent residents in 2021. That's up from about 340,000 in 2019. But what we also forget is in 2019, there were over 400,000 people that came to Canada on study permits and more than 400,000 on work permits. Those aren't even included in the immigration numbers, but they all need places to, to rent when they initially come here. And then they're, they're often buy and invest in properties as well. And of those new immigrants and people coming to Canada, well over 70% land in the largest cities, in Toronto, in Vancouver, in Montreal, and two in Alberta, Calgary and Edmonton as well. I see a lot of those new uh, residents in Canada. So clearly, if we, if we take out if we take out our statistical outliers, so my background in economics and, and finance wise, it's what I took in school for four years, where, you, where if you're looking at a data set wise, you take out a statistical outlier. 2020 is a statistical outlier. You are going to remove it. So if we look at long, long term trends wise, <clears throat> things are going are to continue going up from here based, based on these demographic uh, projections. So that's your buy short opportunity if you want to buy something now. Now, if you're someone that's like, you know what, I just don't want to deal with the headaches wise. Uh, I don't want to deal with getting a mortgage right now. Um, it's not the right time. I don't want to deal with um, trying to find some sort of tenant right now where I, maybe I'll be vacant for a little bit, which could be the case. Um, you know, we, we, do, we, do, we do a significant amount of rentals. Um, the rents I'm going to say that, that you're going to need, or it's going to be very low and it may take a month or two to get someone in there because you also want to put the right person in there. You don't want to deal with, with, the, the, with the rental, the cash flow, and everything like that, but you still want to participate in the opportunities-wise. So that's where the buy-along approach could, could work better for you. So the buy-along approach is we're looking to move past everything that's going on right now. We've removed the statistical outlier. We're looking at forward. Um, where is the puck going? Making a hockey reference-wise. Where is the puck going? So we buy along. So what we look at the pre-construction market and we look at buildings that will be complete 2025, 2026. We, we have the statistical outlier way in our rear view mirror wise. We're, we're back to our regular uh, trajectory in regards to uh, appreciation wise. And what has happened in the pre-construction side is that, well, pre-COVID wise, you were looking at 20% down during a 365 uh, day period wise. Now builders have gotten more aggressive on their uh, deposit structures, meaning that you can get situations where it's 15% down 
over uh, a period of 2020, 2021, 2022. So you're spreading out your capital outlays. Um, so you have a capital conservation wise, you're able to move money into what I call the real estate bank from your own bank. So you move into the real estate bank and you're looking at these buildings closing in 2025, 2026, those, these future closings wise, so that we've profited on the, the, the appreciation, uh, but we haven't had to deal with the headaches uh, that come with buying in the short term and buying on the, on the dip wise. Um, so what you get to take advantage of is capital conservation, lower, lower deposit wise, um, less, uh, less uh, competition to get units so, so you get a, you get a more comfortable environment to, to to buy the premium units wise which what I mean by premium the ideal floor plans uh, the uh, the price points that you want to buy and the exposures of views um, what I've talked to Kyle about offline is this is a great time to add the uh, to upgrade your portfolio to get the really good units in your portfolio wise now it's not the time to buy the dogs a dog's always going to be a dog um, the dog you would would then sell in, in the hot market wise, but the dog is really a dog in 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 the, in the low market wise. So this is the time you want to add the good units wise. So the, so on the pre construction side, you can really pick from a better quality selection of suites wise, and then have a, an attractive deposit structure and avoid all the headaches that come with 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 this now. So you buy short, you 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 buy on the dip or you buy long and you profit on, on the recovery wise. Those are the two opportunities that, that we see for everyone. And what we will be producing um, is a weekly email, which A, shows the uh, buy short opportunities that we see on the market right now. And then the buy long opportunities in regards to these are some great uh, developments. So, you know, for example, Galleria uh, is a building, uh, a, a master plan community that both Kyle and I have invested in. Um, and I know a few people on this call have as well. Um, we think it's an incredible opportunity wise. Um, it's in our backyards. Uh, I was actually driving by yesterday and, and I uh, clients in the car that were looking at something else and they're like, wow, like that, that, that looks, that looks like it's going to be amazing. Um, so it's looking at these, these, these different opportunities and that one there specifically, you have a, a nearly eight acre park that's going with the development wise. So looking at, okay, what's my projected outdoor space in the future wise, um, that's going to have the built-in outdoor space. So you're looking at where these opportunities are, where's my green space, you know, if I want to buy, buy long-wise. Um, and when we talk about the, if I go back to the buy short opportunities-wise, buy short, you know, anyone can look at the market and go, well, that, that, that's a good deal. But it's all about knowing the backstory on certain situations so you know where the really good deal is. So you want to know where the real good deal is. And, and we've already been able to, to secure some of these for our clients wise. And that's where you want to take advantage of people that are really looking to exit the market wise um, for whatever reason. And you're able to slide in there and get it. It doesn't mean that, hey, there's a unit that's listed at 500,000, which depending on the unit, that's a good deal. And you're going to offer them 400,000 and sell to you for 400,000. Those, those things aren't, aren't realistic wise. But what we'll tell you is here's where we see a deal. Here's why it's a good deal. Here's what we expect you to get it for. Um, here's, here's our projections in regards to rent that you'll get it. And here's what your, your estimated cash flow numbers will be. And that'll be going out weekly wise. We'll probably best thing to do that on a Google sheet when that weekly email goes out so that people can, can, can look at, look at this. So um, we're going to be setting that out on a, on a weekly basis why so that's the current opportunities and the buy long opportunities as well Th this window how long will it last could be six months could be less I don't know when the bottom is going to be um, but never try to time the bottom because if you try to time the bottom you're going to miss out on the opportunity altogether was the op I can tell you where the bottom was in 20 in 2008 2008 the bottom was in uh, February 2000 sorry, uh, the bottom was February 2009 that was when the bottom bottom was. I can tell you, and I remember I did my first ever real estate deal in February in 2009, and that buyer was so nervous. She still owns a condo day. She was so nervous, and she's so happy that, 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 that she bought them. We had no idea when the bottom was. I remember speaking with her. I'm like, I don't know when the bottom is going to be. I just know this is a good deal right now. Could it go down a little more? It could go down a little bit more, but you're getting a great interest rate. You're going to be holding this on for, for five years, so why don't you jump on this now and you'll do well on it. And, and, and she did, and she made money in, in, on paper in a few months and obviously has made money in the long run on the property.
Um, so that that's that's where we see the the opportunities going. Now, what we'll do? Oh, go go ahead, Evan. Well, I wanted to throw one thing in while we're talking about the, the economics and, and, and timing, the bottom and stuff. I, I was recently on a call with the. Uh, I was just a participant in that one, but the chief economist of uh, Scotiabank, and one thing that nobody had predicted was the financial well-being of the average Canadian. So just to sum it up in, in under 30 seconds, the average family in Canada has 5% in savings. So if you do 5% of savings, um, I think that works out to uh, 18 days. Uh, they can survive about 18 days without income. And one thing that they didn't predict when they installed the deferral programs along with um, you know, all the vacancies that they were projecting is by the time people did their deferrals, people were stuck at home. Uh, there were no payments for kids' schools. There was no Kumon classes. There was nothing. Um, they were saying that at the end of October, the average Canadian savings has jumped up to 26%, um, which then gives you 94 days. So that's also one of the reasons why um, 2020 being what it is for those that have the ability, um, it has nowhere else but to go up because everybody's, not everybody, but a lot of people are sitting with a lot more cash than they normally had over the last 45 years. Well, here's you know, what it is. No one it, even predicted this. Th this is the most cash ever that we've ever had in our savings account. You know, that, that's not inflation adjusted wise, but just from from just a pure number wise, it's the most cash that, that, that have, on record that has ever been stashed away. That's correct. Um, in, in, in people's people's accounts wise. And that cash will need to go somewhere when things start opening back up. And again, Which is why real estate yeah. is poised for a healthy rebound. When and how, that's uh, yours and Kyle's expertise, but from a financial perspective, uh, there's a ton of cash sitting with people. It, it, so great point. So we you talk about uh, real estate rebound. So we all know that freehold houses have gone up significantly wise, suburban houses, uh, have gone up significantly commuter based cities wise. If we're going out to our KWs, our Guelphs, our Cambridges wise, uh, Windsor, think, things have gone fire. You know, the only market that has gone the other way is the downtown Toronto condo, but all these other markets whew, go, 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 going up like crazy wise. So what that also does, um, and specifically we'll look at Toronto wise, our affordability gap goes like this. And what I mean, affordability gap the price difference between a condo and a freehold property, that gap, that, that gap grows again. So if you're a first time buyer, can you go buy a $2 million house? No, well, you, you theoretically can, but where, where are you getting all the money, the down payment wise to, to, to buy that house? You just don't have, you probably won't have the cash on hand. The, if you're buying a $2 million house, you're gonna need, oh God, what about over $500,000 uh, and what, why I say five hundred thousand dollars? You don't typically get twenty percent down on a two million dollar purchase. Wise, you're probably gonna have to put twenty five percent down on that. Plus, you got the plus you have double land transfer tax on that. Wise, so you're, you're probably gonna need uh, over five hundred thousand dollars to do that purchase. Wise, so the first time buyer just literally doesn't have the liquidity, the cash wise, to buy that house. Wise, so what do they have to buy? Well, they're gonna have to buy a condo to start with. So that'll be their first house. So the condo will be their first. Oh, I should say home. Condo will be the first home then they'll use the condo in five years to buy, buy the house down the road. So as the gap grows in pricing wise, again, between condos and freehold properties, people will be forced to buy the condos just from a pure affordability standpoint. They just won't be able to buy the freehold property. So what you'll do is you'll, you'll see the freehold property flatline in, 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 in values, which we saw before. Um, you'll see, uh, undesirable areas go up in value in Toronto wise. That's typically what, 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 what you see happen. And then because condos are the only thing people will afford, that's where people will go back to the condos again. And that's where, where they'll, they'll be living wise. Because remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, shelter, warmth. Shelter can be a condo or it can be a freehold house. So it's what people will be able to afford. So that, that's what be, people will be able to afford again in the future wise. Nothing has changed. 2020, statistical outlier. Get rid of it. Look at the long-term projections wise. That's what you want to do. You know, this opportunity be four months. It could be six months. Pricing will drop Q4, 2020, Q1, 2021. Q3, 
slow recovery wise into, into, into Q3, 2021, full recovery in 2022 and co downtown Toronto condo pricing wise. Expect to make $100,000 in, 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 um, in 18 months. It'd be, it'd be my prediction wise in regards to, to, to pricing wise. Um, Kyle, do you want to add anything out or should we open up to the floor? Yeah, just that if you are buying a condo now, you're actually locking in your investment numbers now. So your purchase price, um, you know, your mortgage costs, where when the, the, the market starts to recover, the rent will start to increase. Um, the price will start to appreciate as well. So, you know, the longer you get out, the longer you hold it, the better and better that investment is going to become. Yep. And, and we also know that interest rates are going to see this lay until until 2023, they're predicting already so far wise. So you're, you're not going to have a shock to interest rates wise that are going to impact values because interest rates have shot up. So you, you do have the ingredients for a quick elastic rebound in pricing wise. Um, so let's, I, so if anyone does have any questions, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. So if you click in the Q&A tab, you can answer your questions here. So I got the first one. Um, oh. Okay, so here, Kevin, I know Kevin, Kevin well. Emmett didn't realize it, or, or I didn't ask probably. Why do condos attract tier one renters versus single family properties? That's what I meant to ask. Great question. I can I can help answer that one, Kevin was. Well, it's also about the, the, um, the location of that property as well. So if, if I'm looking at a downtown specific condo, there isn't really a single family residence in, in, that, um, in that downtown area wise. So my condo downtown, that's gonna attract my AAA tenant um, because that is a top tier property in regards to type of property to move into. Where, where, where you may get a lower quality tenant would be in an apartment building wise, so a 40 year old apartment building wise. Now, if I go into the single family home, which, which I, I'm personally all, also invested in as well, uh, yes, I can get AAA tenants in, in single family homes in the right locations. It's all about location, which is gonna attract my, my top tier uh, tenant was. But there are a lot of hassles that come with the single family home. Um, being that in a condo, it's a concrete box. I'm just responsible for what's in the walls of the concrete box. In a single family home, I'm responsible what's inside the walls, but also what happens outside of the walls. So uh, landscaping wise, any, any of that, you know, whether there's a roof issue, uh, my hot water tank goes, um, what else can happen with a house wise? Uh, I know I just got my house repointed, um, which is the grout between the bricks wise, that, that cost me $10,000. Um, so dealing with the neighbors and the properties wise, you know, if the, if the neighbors have issues with the tenants or the tenants aren't doing something they're not supposed to wise in a building, I got property management, uh, the building management that's handling any of those conflicts between tenants. I'm not involved, but in, if there's some sort of, uh, issue between the neighbors and the tenants wise, you know, I'm, I'm responsible for that because the, the neighbors are going to come complain to me because I'm the owner of the house wise. So there are just more hassles that come with a house. doesn't mean you can't get a AAA tenant in a house wise. I have it. I've had them. Um, um, but it's more so all the additional hassles that come with the house wise. Uh, again, Kyle, uh, Emmett, you can add anything to that if you want. Yeah. With a house as well, you know, you have the basement, which is typically its own separate unit. Oftentimes it's a third of the rentable property and just the profile for someone that wants to rent a basement, typically they wouldn't have as high as an income. They would be as advanced in, you know, their life cycle as other people would be. You might have a lot more turnover, a lot more hassles and headaches. So with a condo, you know, that often uh, eliminates that scenario. I've seen nice basements, but most of the time they're retrofitted. The basements weren't meant to be lived in. So it really depends on the property more yeah. than ever. I think the other thing to add from, from what I've seen, and you guys can correct it, is you know, when you do have a house versus a condo, um, you know, if you're collecting $1 of rent a month, you're not expected to keep $12 uh, in a house. You need to have a certain budget for repairs and furnaces and windows and blah, blah, blah. So I, I think the historic average is you get to keep about 10 and a half to 11 months of rent over the duration uh, you know, of an asset that's being held. Uh, with the condo, on the other hand, with the exception of paint and stuff like that, um, you know, most of the stuff is handled with the condo fees. So it's a little bit more stable as long as you do have a back-to-back -back tenant situation. 
I'll also add one other thing, and we, we I talked about it la last, because uh, we had a similar question and we talked about it last time. Um, the other thing is, is that um, the freehold single family house is hot. So if I'm buying right now, I'm, I'm buying at, at a peak. I'm buying at the highest price. I'm not getting any deals on a single family house anywhere. So I got to pay, pay the higher price. But if, but if I invest in the condo market, I get to buy where the dip is. Um, I get to buy the lower price. So again, single family homes, uh, I, I own them. I, I, I own multiplexes. But again, I'd be buying at a, at a, at a peak, peak valuation wise. That, that, that's another issue as well. Um, so Emmett, I'll let you uh, touch base on this one because you have the accounting background. Do you use a three-tier corporate structure for holding your properties in your corp? From my understanding, if you don't set up a three-tier structure, you'll be paying close to 50% tax since they consider passive corp. Please share your experiences. Um, yes, I know like, I have holding companies and my, my income is considered passive-wise. Do you know anything about the three three-tier corp? Yeah, so um, I, I think this is what Vino is referring to. It's, you know, you have an operating company, a holding company, and then a possibly a trust that's then holding uh, that, um, that corporation. Uh, to answer the question, um, you don't necessarily pay 50% tax. So if we just do a small example, if you collect $10 in rent and you have expenses of $5 and you're left with $5 of profit, um, even if it's in a corporation, it's taxed at the small business rate, which is 15%. And even if you don't opt to use a corporation, uh, it's taxed at your personal tax rate, which is on the personal T1 general. Um, I know we've had numerous uh, webinars regarding corporate holding versus personal. Um, I think overall corporate holding uh, is for um, professional corporations, which is like doctors and lawyers and soon to be real estate agents and accountants and stuff like that. But for the average investor, uh, a corporate holding structure is not necessarily required. Uh, but again, I think we have a lot of webinars talking about that if people want to. Yeah. Learn. Yeah. If, if you're just a T Ford individual wise, um, you don't need to set, set up a complicated uh, corporate structure wise. You, you just buy them in your, in, in your personal names. Um, that, that is what you would do. Um, that's, that's the most tax efficient strategy. Um, how has the vacancy in Toronto downtown been trending in the last 12 months? Well, at the beginning of the year, there was no COVID. So uh, it's, it's trending. The vacancy is increasing wise because the people don't have, have, uh, have a reason to live downtown. So we don't, we don't track the actual vacancy wise. We just track in regards to what the months of inventory that's available wise and how that um, looks at compared to, to 20, 2019. There's lots of vacancy downtown right now. Um, but again, if you price your property correctly, the warm body will go into the property and you'll have a cash flow into the property wise. That's the key thing. Remember, this year is a statistical outlier. So, so don't worry about current vacancies or anything like that. There is a man-made reason why people aren't coming downtown right now. When I remove that dam, the people will come flooding back into downtown. Nothing has changed in regards to why people want to live downtown other than the fact that it's all closed. Once you open it all back up, the people will flow back into the downtown core. That's what the, well, that's what you have to look at. Um, yeah, and Alex, to add, add numbers to that. Um, the, the number of units available for rent downtown, it shot up significantly through March, April, and May, you know, over doubling the number of units that were available. Mm -hmm. Over since about August, it's actually held quite constant in between six and 7,000 units available on the market each week. So we're not seeing big spikes. It does look you know, very stable now. Um, and it's really continued to balance within that, that range. Um, we've also seen the number of units rented compared to this time last year. It's significantly more than in 2019. So people are absolutely out there renting units. It's that it actually can be very easy to rent a unit. It comes down mainly to price though. You're not gonna get those prices you were getting earlier in this year. So if you're reasonable, 100%, you can rent your unit out today in the downtown. Yeah, and, and so I do know that number that Kyle's referencing. The, uh, the number of leases done in October was 80% greater than October, 2019. So 80% greater. 
I know the number of leases that were done in 2019 in October wise, it was a thousand, uh, roughly a thousand units were done in October, 2019. So that has increased 80% in 2021. So people are coming back downtown, but I'll tell you a few things. Number one, yeah, you gotta be priced correctly or they're not gonna rent your unit. Number two, if there's currently a tenant in the unit, it's probably not gonna rent until that tenant moves out because if I got a vacant unit here, why do I even wanna go see someone that's something li that someone's living in right now? I, I don't even wanna see that. So units will rent after the tenant moves out. So you may be stuck with a month of vacancy wise in your unit if you're an existing landlord, if your tenant is leaving, because it's very difficult to rent a tenanted unit out these days. A, because who wants to go see that unit and be the tenant in that unit's going, oh, who do I even want it in my unit wise? I don't want anyone in my unit. And the stories that we have heard from tenants going, I'm not allowing showings. Well, they, they should be uh, award-winning authors in regards to the stories they're providing, regards to why they can't let people in their units. Um, so that, that's just the reality of the situation these days. Now, Eric asks, what areas of downtown have seen the, the most price drop inventory increase? Other words, what part of downtown should we be looking at specifically was? Now, here's the key. Again, if you want to have the most efficient um, investment, it's you want to focus on buildings that do not have rent control. So it's buildings completed after November 15th, 2018. So those are sprinkled in different areas across uh, the downtown core. Um, so th that's what you want, want to, to focus in on. I can say one area that, that, that visibly where I see a lot of increase uh, would be along the, uh, the Young and Bay Street corridor wise, because those relied a lot on the international student population coming in. That number is significantly dropped wise. So I would say th those areas are disproportionately impacted since they got the double whammy of just no immigration, no uh, international students coming in, and then no workforce as well. So that, so that, that is an area where, where we've seen a buildup of, of properties wise is, is along that corridor wise. So the specific building in I own in um, seven Grenville, which is YC condos. It also falls into the built after uh, November 15, 2018. I owned a studio. I own a studio unit there. I furnished it. I had to rent it for $2,400 per month. COVID hit the furnished market. Like that, that just, that, that just got obliterated didn't exist anymore. So I went from $2,400 a month to I, I eventually rented my studio for 1450 unfurnished wise. I took all my furniture out wise. That whole furnished market will come back for me and I'll be able to get back up to 2400 once once things normalize again. Um, but I ended up renting my unit just for 1450 wise. So you can see where the opportunity is in regards to the great increases that you can have um, in specific buildings. Um, that are hurting right now. These things aren't going to last. Um, and if I go specifically in that location again, I'm, I'm at Young and College. I have U of T right there. I have Ryerson right there. I have the whole hospital district right there. That area is going to come roaring back um, when, um, again, prices normalize and that kind of thing. But am I going to get a $500,000 one bedroom at location? No, I'm not. That, 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 that's not, that's not going to come in that specific location wise, but I am on the young subway line. Um, I'm on the college streetcar line. Um, you can't go wrong in, in that location wise. Uh, but again, any, we're, we're looking at specific buildings wise and buildings built after a certain time period and every building it's own, is its own little neighborhood and everything like that. So it, it's very acute to what we're going to be looking at. That's where we're going to be doing the analysis and providing that uh, to our members and subscribers. Yep. Yeah. And also the other opportunity um, is assignments wise. So uh, what assignments are is people that bought pre-construction and uh, they, may not have, they may not have the ability to close. Now, when I say they don't have the ability to close, Amit can always get someone to mortgage wise. They're just choosing that they don't want to go down the path to go get the mortgage wise, which may uh, result in, in higher carrying costs and that kind of thing. But there are people that are spooked that are looking to get out of those contracts as well. So there's opportunities for people to, to jump on those. And those aren't actively uh, marketed on MLS or anything like that. So those could be opportunities uh, as well. There are some higher closing costs on those. Um, so that's another opportunity out there as well. But again, we're going to have those weekly uh, emails going out and just presenting these opportunities. Everyone. There's one more question for you guys. Yeah, yeah Kevin. From yeah. Al. Oh, from the chat. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer Kevin's quickly and then we'll go to Al's on the chat. So some developers don't allow assignments. Why? And why do some allow them? So 
The answer is, um, you know, most developers do allow assignments, but I, I will put an asterisk about that on their terms. So meaning that uh, there are certain windows when they open up the assignments to be allowed when you're allowed to assign those. And why that typically is, is that if the builder still has existing inventory wise, they don't want um, people selling an assignment wise undercutting uh, their pricing of existing inventory. That's generally the reason why. Um, now, if, if it's more of a, uh, where there's specific times where they don't allow assignments, um, it could be somewhere, uh, again, this is more on the freehold market wise, where they're focusing in on single families as opposed to uh, speculators that, that are trying to profit on that. And they don't want a bunch of speculators moving into a neighborhood and buying those. But but yeah, most, most builders do allow assignments. But again, the asterisk is there's a window when they allow that assignment. Um, and I can also say there are some workarounds on those. Um, if there's a specific situation where someone's wants to sell it, but the builder is not allowing assignments wise, there's, there, there is some workaround on that. It gets a little complicated, uh, but there are some workarounds at, on that as well. Um, well, see, again, uh, so, so what, what, I guess you guys don't see the questions. Someone's asking what's the reasonable rent for a two bedroom, two bath in a downtown core. It, that's such a loaded question. Depends on the building, depends on, on the neighborhood depends on the age of the unit, depends on the size of the unit. So it, it, it could range from 21 to over 3,000. It, it, it's not specific in regards to, oh, I'm going to rent my two bedroom unit, two bathroom unit for this. It's very specific to the building, the unit, the square footage, the exposure, locker, parking, so many different things go, go, go into that. That's again where we'll, we'll have uh, I can tell you one will rent for three thousand, and then you buy one that's only going to rent for twenty two hundred. You know, it, it, it's it's it, it's a very um, there are a lot of different moving parts when we do an analysis on very specific things. There are apples, oranges, grapes, bananas. It's not not an it's not an apple orange uh, apple to apple comparison list. So I think there was a, a question in regards to the chat wise. Um, the condo title is in my name. If I add my son in the title, will that trigger capital gain? Do you want to handle that one, Emmett? It would be my pleasure. So uh, when you're, so this goes back to that three-tiered question that somebody had asked. Um, when you're transferring property from a parent to a child or even a, a sibling, there are numerous ways to accomplish this. Um, the easiest way is by paying the estate taxes to the government. Um, those taxes are generally 1.25% uh, on owner occupied, but then it can be as high as 50% on a rental. Uh, but that usually gets triggered uh, when someone passes away. But if you're trying to transfer a property to a child now, uh, there are a couple of ways to do it. You can do it through a family trust, um, which your, your personal accountant or your tax uh, lawyer could provide the setup on that. And then the easier way to do it, which I've seen numerous times is, again, through your lawyer, uh, you can create like a bear trust agreement that the property was held on behalf of the child. Um, and that's another way to, to get the property over to them. If any of these three metrics are not uh, something you want to do or the cost is too high, then yes, you would trigger capital gains. But there are numerous ways to avoid the capital gain, but it's not free. Either you set up a trust agreement or you go through a tax lawyer or you set up a family trust, but um, you can't just transfer property without incurring some minor costs at least. Great answer. Uh, Vino, uh, asking about Airbnbs. Here's, here's the issue. Airbnbs aren't allowed in Toronto by, by, the, by the city of Toronto wise. Right? There, there are ways you can rent your, your property on Airbnb wise, but it has to be a principal residence. They're only allowing Airbnb on your principal residence wise. So to say to buy a condo and you're gonna rent it out and then put it on Airbnb, um, they've eliminated that. that. That was eliminated this year. Um, so you can't do that anymore. Um, so so to th that, unfortunately, that investment strategy doesn't work because it's not about the building allowing it. It's that the, the city of Toronto doesn't allow that situation anymore. So I wouldn't advise buying on a unit based on future Airbnb revenue wise because uh, currently you're not able to do that wise. Could you find a way to work around it? Probably. Uh, but I wouldn't rely on that as an investment strategy was. 
Um, Tiffany, if you're now getting 1400 rent for a Bay studio, how will you be able to, to uh, jump back to 2400 post COVID? Can you make the jump in one step? Yeah. Buildings built after November 15, 2018, they do not have rent control, which means is once the tenant goes month to month after a one year lease, I have the ability to increase the rent with 90 days notice. So yes, I can do it. I can do it in one jump. And that's why we're focused on buying units in that period built after November 15, 2018. If you're an investor. Now, if you are an end user, you're moving into it or your child's moving into it, you can buy any unit. That, that, that doesn't matter because your metric is you need a roof over someone's head. You're taking advantage of the opportunity. And if they're going to live there for three years and then you plan to rent it out, well, then we've gone back to normal rents anyways wise. So you, you don't need the strategy of buying in a building in, uh, built after November 15th, 20, 2018. But if you're a strict investor and you're renting it right now, you want to have the ability to increase the rent in the future because the danger is the tenant won't leave and you could be stuck at that rent for 10 years uh, and you're only able to increase the rent by the provincially prescribed amount, which is typically one to 2% per year. Um, so that's that's the key in regards to taking taking advantage of these, these opportunities possible. Um, is there any more questions? Uh, if there isn't, we'll wrap things up. Um, this will be, this has been recorded. Everyone will get a summary. Um, this will be sent out to everyone. You'll probably get that tomorrow wise. Uh, it will also be posted on our website as well. Uh, we're running three webinars next week. So um, we're doing one on bill 184, uh, which talks about um, landlord and tenant rights during, uh, during this period wise. We're doing one about how to build a $14 million uh, real estate portfolio. And then we're doing another webinar uh, on this one. Okay, uh, I'll answer this one last question. What is the profile of people who are currently moving, signing new leases in Toronto? Professionals, um, you know, he, here's one of the things. People left downtown, went and moved with their, with their parents for a little bit wise. They're sick of living with their parents and they need somewhere to live. They, they're, they're moving back downtown. Those professionals are moving back downtown. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's professionals wise that are now looking at the opportunity and going, wow, I can live downtown for, studio for 1300 one bedroom 1600 1700 when I was when I was 2300 last year wise they're taking advantage of the affordability and the opportunity to move back down at an affordable rate so even though the lifestyle has been impacted you can't go to restaurants uh, you can't uh, you can't go to live events there's still the vibrance there's still some vibrancy to downtown just walking down the street and seeing other people is a nice thing versus if you live in a suburban neighborhood you don't even have sidewalks um, yeah, we've seen this a lot. People are just looking to upgrade the units that they're living in downtown. Yeah, um, I actually yeah. did this and ended up moving to a larger unit in the same building. For the same price probably, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've seen well, that and, and this is where we go, upgrading units wise. So if you if there's a dog, your dogs are the ones that are going to be hurting right now. So so if I'm a tenant wise, why, why do I want to live in that crappy unit when I live in that good unit wise? So this is a good time to pick up pick up the good stuff. You don't want the dogs. The dogs are what's going to hurt when the when the when the market market goes down. The dogs are fine in a hot market, but when things go down, those ones are going to be the unrentable and unsellable stuff. So everyone, thank you so much for coming on. Um, you'll have that recap email uh, and then an opportunity to get on our list in regards to top investment opportunities every week. Okay, guys, talk soon. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys.